Welcome back, everyone. This is Chase, and joining me today, uh, I have two guests uh, with Rainey's Premium Flies um, and Streamworks, uh, Rainey Riding and Ellen Clark. Thank you for joining me. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you. Yeah, I should mention the two owners owners of the company. Any other titles that I forget forgot? Rainey, you know, definitely the founder. Um, but what Rainey other titles? Is mostly over the production quality control, and I'm over the business marketing. So that's kind of our division as far as responsibilities. Kind of clarifies why we're a team. Right. Well, and then I I should mention in their fly designer as well, Rainey. That would be Rainey. <laughs> Well, I, I'm excited to talk to you because um, I just the history of this company, I, it's, it's amazing to me um, just what, what you've been able to build um, and a company that's been around for a long time. Um, there's not many companies out there that are you know, close to, to 50 years old. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that just doesn't really happen very often. Yeah, especially um, since Brady's 52. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's incredible. <laughs> Probably the young, youngest founder of all time, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I just, I wanted to make sure that, that we, we had a conversation and people, you know, in, in Cash Valley know the history of this company and, and what, what you've been able to build. Um, in addition to the people that connect with our program from all over the country, um, you know, the, the history of this, this brand. So, you know, I wanted to get into that a little bit today. Um, but Rainey, do you mind sharing a little bit about your, your backstory? And, and I know some of it's online, but how did you get into fly fishing? Where were you growing up and, and where did this love of, of fly fishing start for you? Uh, born and raised in Roseville, Utah. My granddad, uh, was a, uh, camper and fisherman and he took me with him on a a fishing trip up above in the high Uintas and I caught my very first fish age five on a fly. We actually used a fly with a bobber and he would do, we threw it out and the fish would take it. So we did, it was a primitive form of fly fishing but it was actually something we did and I actually caught my first fish on a fly so many years ago. So that would be we're talking 60 years, 60, about 60 years ago, seven years old, yeah. Yep. And um, from there, uh, well, just being born and raised out there, and my, one of the reasons I had such a passion for it was that uh, my father had, we, I was my father's third son, <laughs> is what I refer to. We had two, uh, but we were raised out on a cattle ranch, and lots of uh, extra chores had to be done and so my dad put me in as his third son and I learned how to bale hay and rake hay and irrigate and all that kind of stuff and but after we were done we'd do that early in the morning especially when we were baling hay and so we'd get up at five o'clock and then we'd go fishing my older brother would go fishing with me in the high uenas and we were so I was still doing it still using the bobber method but but anyway so that was kind of the passion that I had and and uh, I love my granddad, and it was just some, something to have to do fun with him. It was just a lot of fun. So I ended up, uh, as I was graduating from high school, uh, the year after I graduated, I was hired by Utah State University Extension and working with Art Jones, who I was his personal secretary, if you will. And uh, my job was to go to the airports and pick up campus professors, drive them to their classes, and then after the classes were over, drive them back to the airport so they could get back to Utah State University or Logan, here in Logan. And we, Art Jones had decided to offer a fly tying class, and no big deal to me. I didn't really, I didn't really, didn't perk my interest at the time, but Apparently, we had, well, we had 36 guys who'd signed up for the class, and that's way too many to teach a fly tying hands-on class. And so he called me at home, and he said, I need you to get to the office ASAP. And I thought, what have I done? I mean, I was just so worried about something that I had done wrong. And when I got there, he said, did you know we had 36 guys sign up for this class? And I said, no, I, honestly, I didn't. And he said, well, I, there's no way I could teach 36 guys. So you have two choices. I either 
we reschedule a fly, the class, or we teach you how to tie a couple of flies and you teach half the group and I'll teach half the group. Well, it was when he called me and I was at home, it was about 5.30. By the time I got to the office, it was six o'clock. By the time we'd had our little brief, brief discussion, it was almost definitely 6.30. And so some of these guys who had already left for classes, for a class that starts at seven, if they're coming in from Tabiona or Jensen area over in the Vernal area, there's no way. We, we, there, so I said, Art, it's impossible to call and reschedule a class. They've already, they're already on their way. And so he said, well, you're gonna learn two flies then. How do you feel about that? And I said, I'm on, let's show me what I need to do. And he taught me two flies. It was a woolly worm was the first one and an ant, a string ant, excuse me, a thread ant body. And so I was able to, actually I just bluffed. That's the only thing I can say. I bluffed my way through it. Everybody thought I'd been doing it for years. So the next week Art said, well, what do you want to do? Do we do you want to reschedule the class and we'll do it too? Or do, will you accept the challenge and you learn a couple more flies and teach? He said, well, that sounds fun because I really had a fun time. It was like, <laughs> bluff, bluff, bluff. So anyway, so for a 10 week period, he taught me each week, he taught me two more flies until we had completed the class. And so there was about 20 flies that I had actually learned by the time the class was over with. And, uh, and it just perked my interest. And so I started looking into it to see, well, number one, where do I get materials? And number two, what do we use to, you know, we had the prim a primitive vice when we, back in those early days. It was not a very good vice uh, compared to what we now have available to us. So that's kind of how I got into the fly tying part of my career. Where, where was that class taught? Uh, it was actually taught at, in Roosevelt. Okay. And, and we did, we did eventually end up in Bernal, but we started, the whole thing started in, in Roosevelt and then we, we did it now, we, then we did it for a lot of years, well, for th three or four more years that I was out there, we actually continued teaching the fly time class, but, but then he let me do it because he was busy doing other things. So was that the first year that, that fly tying was taught at, through USU Extension? Had they done it before? Was, that, was this the first time? This was the first time, but it was non-accredited this time. The mm. first was non-accredited. It was just something fun that guys would come in and, and, and take the class. We didn't have any women. I don't remember any women. Wives showed up with their husbands to uh, maybe more of an observe, but not to actually teach and learn how to do it. So. Right. Right. And what, what year was that? Uh, that was in, would have been in 1971. Okay. So when, when, when did you make that formal decision to start your own company? Well, I had been married and had a couple of kids and over the months and the, the three or four years, I had a foot locker is what we called it. And as I would get um, materials, I put them in this foot locker and it became a real hobby for me. And I loved it. It was, it was just having fun tying flies, stripping them down and reusing the hook and retying something until I felt like I had it mastered. And uh, oh yes, we were talking about my husband. Anyway, he got pretty fed up with me about all this waste of material is that what he was looking at, which I understand. And he left to go to school, into school, and we were living in Wellsville at the time. And when he left going to school, he just said, I need you to just seriously, I want you to count, take everything out of that foot locker and assess a price to it, what you paid for it. If it's still written on it, I want you to pay it, pay for it. Well, over that four or five years, I had accumulated when I added it up, it was just barely over $3,000 that I had purchased in materials and not made a dime off of from anybody. So that's when I actually went professional, which would have been 1976. I tied, I did tie some flies commercially a little bit, but not something that I could actually make a living at. But in 1976, I decided it was time to see if I could make that into a, a, a hobby slash profession slash I was going to school at Utah State as well. And it became a way that I could support uh, the school studies that we were doing as well as uh, keeping uh, the family fed. And I was making pretty good money for that time of, in my life, which was about, um, I've been making just a little over $15,000 a year making. I mean, that was my pr profit, which I was using to support the family. 
and we we just decided that's the way it was going to be. And so, but in the meantime, I was taking classes as well at the university, and my major was in choral conducting, as in, as in music, choral conducting. And I loved it. It was just a passion that I had. And so my senior year, nearly the graduation of my senior year, I had a couple of classes left I needed to, to, to uh, finish up, but my, the music is in uh, the professor, what are they called? It's the, over, I were a department, what's it called? I can't remember. Just department uh, head? The head of the department, the head of the music department. Yeah. Anyway, he, the, well, not, he wasn't the dean, but he definitely had a, but anyway, he came to me and he said, look, we've had an offer come. We need a, we need a high school music teacher up in uh, Rock Springs, Wyoming. And if you'll accept the offer, uh, we'll, um, I'll go ahead and graduate you and you just don't have to finish those last three classes that you need. Well, as I evaluated it and I went, traveled up to Rock Springs and look, looked over the situation. By then I had, we had four children and I went and I was offered, the offer that they made me was much less than what I was actually tying flies for. And I went, no, I, I you know, not at this time, I just couldn't do it. And so that's when I actually, the door turned for me that I said, I'm going to make this my income. This is what I want to do period. That's that. So that was a turning point on what's actually launched this major business. And that was around, that was 76. That was in 76. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how were you, how were you selling flies at that time? I mean, it, you were doing really well um, selling a, a lot of, a lot of product. Who were your customers and how did you reach them at that time? That's a good question. There was a magazine called Fly Fishing the West, which originated up in the Oregon, Oregon Washington area, the magazine was, and I took out an ad in there and then in Field and Stream. Now in Field and Stream, I took like a one inch by one inch in the back, which at that time was seven or almost $500 for just a one inch by one inch. That's early seventies, that's just, anyway. And then so the Fly Fishing the West, I was able to, for the same amount of money, I was able to run a half page ad and I solicited uh, shops, you know, if you fly shop, a commercial tire looking for work kind of thing is what it said. And I had, there were several shops that actually um, uh, or, uh, got in touch with me regarding these ads. And so my very first one that I had was uh, the Raymond Drump Company, which is on the East Coast. And uh, they basically launched me big time because they were ordering in like, uh, like we had 300, or one order came in at 360 dozen muddler minnows. And so I'm going like, okay, what's a muddler minnow? I didn't even at the time even have any idea what a muddler minnow was. So I did some more research. I accepted the offer and, and I never scrambled so hard in my life to learn how to spin deer hair. And that's because that's, that's basically what that fly is. A, is a beautiful fly, but with a nice spun head on the, on the hook eye side of it. So, and then I had a shop in Champa, New Mexico that did a lot of business with me. I had some California shops. I had a couple in Idaho, up in the panhandle of Idaho. But I had one time I was servicing about 15 different companies fly tying. And that's how I was making my money. And I did make good money from those several shops that I was dealing with. And along that line, uh, we were very limited as to what materials we had. A lot of it was, I mean, we're talking about natural materials, deer hair, elk hair, moose hair, uh, chuck uh, grouse, uh, chicken feathers, uh, anyway, it's not, no synthetics. It was just all of these, uh, animal products that, and so we were very limited, but I wanted to, I was so intrigued by this that, you know, the, the hatches were going on. I learned how to read the water and lift up rocks and decide, you know, so I started to, well, that's what the fish are eating. So that's why I need to come up with something to to tie. And so it literally launched me another was another stepping stone for me to uh, expand our company. And then in time, I couldn't keep up with it very well. I had uh, had about 15 to 20 fly tires that we solicited here in the Cache Valley area to tie for them for me. And uh, but eventually we all that all dwindled away as well. And so it was then at that point, and then I'll have Ellen cover that in a minute, we ended up over in uh, Asia to tie flies after she came on board with me. Right. So how, how long were, 
how long were you tying everything just by yourself? And at what point did you say, this is too much, I got to get help to come in and, and support okay. me? Good question. Uh, I was, let's see, let's see. I haven't talked about how many years. Um, 30 years ago, uh, I had reached a point where I was tying about uh, five to 6,000 dozen flies a year servicing those 15 shops. Wow. That's about all I could crank out because you, you can do, you can tie quickly, but we're not a machine. You know, it's not that we can tie any faster than our ha hand eyesight coordination allows us to do. And so I had the, 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 um, Mr. Jacobson, what was his first name? I can't remember. His son, anyway, he called me on the phone one day. He was over the uh, USU extension there at Utah State, here at Utah State. And he uh, uh, asked me if I would consider his teaching his son how to tie flies. And I said, well, how old is he? And he said, he's 10. I said, no, I don't, I, I won't touch it. He's got to be at least 12. He said, no, please just give him a try chance. And so I had him come over and we, uh, I mean, I was so nervous about it because I didn't want to disappoint his father and say, no, I don't want to do it. On the other hand, what he was, he, he was able to watch me and literally sit down and imitate no matter what I did, he was able to imitate it. And so he started, so it was just the two of us for a long time. That boy is now a very gifted surgeon. Yes, yeah, he was, he was incredible. But yes, he's living up in Montana now, fishing his eyes or fishing his, anytime he doesn't have to be in the office operating on something, I guess. <laughs> he still has kept up with it, but. So then at that point, we can, he was able to pick up about a thousand dozen different patterns. And then it just got to a point where I just couldn't do it. So then I ran an ad in the Herald Journal here in, in the Valley and solicited uh, fly tires from the university. You want to go to school, earn money and support your family kind of thing. And I ran, oh well, yeah, I was teaching a lot of classes, teaching them. I taught them for free if they would just commit to me for a year and tying flies for me. And for the most part, they committed until I graduated from the university. So we had about a, every year we had a serious churn for, you know, rotating them in, new tires. And it just got to the point where it was not financially good for our company because it, you teach someone how to tie flies and you it it really takes uh, about two years to have that teaching lesson pay for itself and so if they only come and tie for you for one year you basically maybe break even but you certainly don't gain anything from it right right no that makes sense do you do you feel like we're kind of getting into the legacy a little bit um you know of the company and your work do you feel like you inspired or trained like a generation of fly like fly fishermen and women in the community do you feel like because you provided that opportunity here locally i just so many more people got exposed to the sport because of that and and i don't know you uh, you mentioned this this one little boy really developed this love for fly fishing because of that do you feel like you were a, a big contributor in that movement or that generation becoming interested in fly fishing oh absolutely Absolutely. There was no question about it. Some of them were just there truly to learn uh, to get through school. But, but most of the people that we ended up starting to fly, tie flies, they all went on to do also fly fishing. So yes, I would have to say yes to that question. That's, that's great. Um, you know, it's it just, I can't even imagine like starting a company at that time and, and having, you know, a customer reach out and say, make this fly for me. And you don't even know what it looks like. And, and you have to go and try to find that information and, um, and, you know, to try to track down materials, like you said, I, I, I'd love to get into that a little bit. How do you even find a source for, for deer hair or moose hair? Like, how did, how did you source materials at that time? Well, uh, there was a company down in the Ogden area uh, it was called Herders, H-E-R-T-E-R-S, and they were kind of a miscellaneous kind of shop, but they sold a few flies and they had a few materials. They, like that's where I found my first deer hair, uh, some feathers and some marabou, just some basic, uh, basic patterns. Uh, we're spoiled now because we have everything available to us. I mean, there's so many now in this business. 
And I think Ellen and I were uh, a huge part in developing, uh, our, taking our skills and uh, sharing them. And I think that it, we had a huge influence in the in industry here in the States. I really do believe that. So. Yeah, that, that kind of leads me to my next question. What was the state of fly tying up to this point? Uh, you probably didn't have, and correct me if I'm wrong, big companies who were mass producing flies. I imagine it was a lot of people in their garage, right? Absolutely. Making, making right. their own own yep. stuff. Yes, yes. Some of our uh, friendly competitors that we have, their stories tell start as a garage enterprise is what they say. And so there were uh, about five, five of us in, back in the 1971 to 74 time frame that there were other people also, I have come to find out, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but they were also trying to source out materials and, and, uh, and tie flies commercially so that they could deliver. To, and uh, fly shops were very sparse. You didn't, we maybe had, boy, in Utah, maybe five or six little mom and pop places that were selling fishing stuff like the rappellas and stuff. And they also had a little bit of flies. And so I picked up some business locally about doing that a little bit as well. So, but a huge influence I think we had. And I think to add to that influence is there was a time there that we had a retail fly shop here in Logan before we went to Thailand. And that retail fly shop, it wasn't huge, but it was actually one of the best ones, especially in Northern Utah. And with that, Rainy is a certified caster. And so we also give clinics that in, involved teaching them how to tie flies. And then we would teach them how to cast. And they would go out and catch fish with the fly they tied. No, I'm glad you added that. Um, let's see. Uh, when did, so you mentioned a little bit about, um, Rainy, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, getting an order in for a fly um, versus being out on the river and, and figuring out how to imitate the natural world. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by that, like having to create, you know, you're, you're in the business of deception a little, a little bit in the case of the fish, that's, right? That's true. Um, <laughs> but like, how did you, when did, when did that start? Like creating your own patterns and, and now I don't know if this figure is, right? I got this figure off your website, but it's probably bigger than this, right? 850 exclusive fly patterns, all of those that you designed? Yeah, six, I don't know, 600, 700. No, I have so many, I don't know. Yeah, we <laughs> so, yeah. oh, that's true. We trade, uh, we, we, uh, we put to yes, retire. Um, but yes. Obviously, I came to understand as I was reading the water and you'd see the fish rise and gulp and gulp and gulp or they come out of the water really hard and splash on a hit. You go, well, obviously, they're in this water somewhere. Something's going on. So I started li lifting rocks up and then I would take specimens home and then I would look at it and I kept them in water, in the stream water. Long and I, I had to do it repetitively because they wouldn't live very long. But I would look at them and see their involvement of the, the hatch that goes on. And so you literally have to look at it and go, well, I could use this, maybe a little bit of material like this. We could imitate, you know, so that's really how it started. But again, it was all natural materials. There wasn't any synthetics at that time. Uh, the, the Flaming Gorge called me on the phone and, and uh, uh, his, uh, the Colette, uh, what was that? Guy Colette was our contact person up there. And he said, Rainy, we need to do something here on the Green River that gets, we have, we, we have the cicada hatch that comes off and they, they're black and they're ugly and they float and they flounder right on the water. We need to be able to imitate something that we can do that with. So in the meantime, Ellen and I had become friends and she had to go up to Park City to do some classes or some training. And uh, I stayed back at the, our, the place we were staying at and I made telephone call after telephone call after telephone call to try to figure out a foam that could be manufactured that would, could imitate the cicada because they had great big round ugly bodies. I mean, it's just ugly. And I started off with a lady in, uh, was it in Roanoke, Virginia? Or Roanoke? Mm -hmm. So and we, I just called so many. I had made a list and, and uh, uh, you're also back at a time where we didn't have email so readily available either, that kind of thing. So you basically did everything, did everything on the telephone the best you could. So uh, anyway, after calling, oh, I'm guessing 
30 to 50 different companies on the East Coast that were dealing in foam that I could find out. I ended up calling the one lady first back in Roanoke and uh, I said, please just, just, I promise you, if it, this goes, we can really do some serious mass production of different foam sizes and colors. So anyway, she went ahead and she extruded some black foam in three different sizes for me to have a look at, which I was able to in turn start making cicadas with. It was wonderful, it was incredible material, high flotation. You know, I wanted to get into, um, well, I, and before that, I, I just think the business that you're in and, and the products that you design, um, and we, we get in, into this a little bit with our students, but um, for certain activities, it's hard to design a product if you don't really know what that activity is or, or what it feels like. You know, we have students who want to make climbing equipment or skis or, you know, products for a very specific activity. And it's a lot easier to like make a good product if you've done that activity or you've participated, like you understand the pain points. And, and it just seems like the business that you're in making flies, it's, it seems like it's, there's so much feel that's in it. Like you got to be out there and you got to observe and you got to, you got to feel how, you know, that the fish reacts um, to this thing that you create. I, I don't, that's not necessarily a question, but is there something to that? where it's, it's, there's just so much feel in it and you've got to be out on the river and, and iterate on that, that fly that you create. And, and there's just sounds like there's so much testing involved to, that you'd really only understand if, if you're out there on the river yeah. using it. I think with any uh, thing like that, you actually have to almost learn another language. Hmm. Yeah. Because in our industry, the fish, we're trying to imitate the fish diet. And so you have to not, you have to literally learn a whole new language on the entomology and everything and phytite and materials and, and you, have to, you have to develop a passion for the sport in which you're trying to design something for, which we do, particularly Rainy and her son. They, Rainy would almost rather fish than play music, but <laughs> so yeah, you do have to have a passion for it to really understand it and be able to tweak it and make it work. Right. It, it sounds like it just takes hours out on the river to, which, you know, that, that doesn't sound bad, right. Being out there, but, um, and that, that leads to another question. Um, I was going to reserve this for the end, but I, I think this is a good time to bring it up. Has it ever felt like work being out there testing product? I know some people, their passion and their work blend together and the magic wears off. Um, how, how have you been able to keep it fun for so long? It is a passion for me. There's no question about it. And there's something about tying a fly and taking that out to a river and catching your first fish off of it. I mean, it's just, wow. It's a real power, feel good kind of thing. Um, well, at this point, I, I, I want to learn a little bit more of like how, Ellen, how you got involved in this, like how you two got connected. Ellen, some of your background um, as well and how, how you got involved in all of this. And Well, I tell Rainy that I backed into it. She walked into it and I backed into it. <laughs> <laughs> because Rainy was my across the street neighbor when I very first met her. And she was my across the street neighbor for about a year before I actually went over and offered her some produce from my garden to introduce myself as her neighbor. And at the time she was newly divorced and looking for a third job. And so I suggested she apply for the company I was working with. I was a marketing manager for the local cable TV company, which is ironic because I grew up without television. Mm. And um, so we actually hired Rainy to be our dispatcher. And at the time she was working three jobs, trying to support her family without any additional income from child support. Um, and so we kind of became fast friends because I found out that she liked to play racquetball. And at the time I loved playing racquetball. And so between what few minutes during the week that she had, we went and played racquetball as often as we could. And at the time she was, um, working for us as a dispatcher and she did that for a couple of years and we were pretty good friends and I used to go over and help her get some of our materials ready and I would kind of teach her kids uh, sometimes I'd uh, help her kids with their homework because she was busy tying flies and after a couple of years of this I said Rainy you can't maintain this very long what do you really want to do with your life and she said well I would like to be have a job where I stayed at home so my kids were not latchkey kids and I said, well, let me just remarket you. 
because at the time when I met Rainy, she had a sign on the outside of her house that said Rainy's Trout Flies. And during that time, she had invented quite a few fly tying tools that streamlined the process so that you could tie more dozen flies. And also she had gone into the synthetics, which was kind of new in the industry. And I said, let me just remarket you because I knew that the greatest asset I couldn't market and that was her reputation. She already had an exceptional reputation throughout the United States. We hadn't gone worldwide yet. And so I suggested she resign from the cable company and I would remarket her. And um, that was in 1989 that she resigned. And the day that she handed in, in fact, my boss came to me and she, he said, well, do you think Rainey can do this? And I said, I know she can do it. And so he signed her, her resignation notice. And the day that, she, that he did that, she went home and only to find out that her youngest daughter wanted to go live with her dad, which kind of defeated the whole point. And so I knew that that meant that I needed to really help her remarket her company. And so with my marketing background, I have a master's at Utah State University in instructional technology with the master's, uh, excuse me, with the marketing emphasis. And so um, I quickly redesigned the logo and we changed the name from Rennie's Trout Flies because that's too limiting. There's only selling trout flies to Rennie's Flies and Supplies because she had also invented tools and materials that were unique to the industry. And then what we did um, is we, would, we hit the road and started doing trade shows all across the United States. Got a little trailer and, and started doing trade shows and it kind of boomed from that. But we I have to tell you, Chase, that we went, we were in 49 states in a very short period of time. The last state we were in was Utah. Wow. <laughs> and of all the cities in Utah, the last city we were in is Logan, Utah. Really? Even wow. to this day. Even to this day. Wow. Which is, which is interesting because I think people believe that two women don't know what they're doing about fly fishing. And Rainy is an avid fisher person. I love it too, but she's passionate and I enjoy it. And we've since fished quite a few different places, Costa Rica and all across the United States and in Utah a lot. Uh, now she fishes a lot with her son or when she can get out and she feels good. But but so I kind of brought the marketing part of it. And I was just an across the street neighbor that grew up with six brothers and my dad would take them fishing, but not me. Mm. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I backed into it, uh, but I'm glad that I did. And pretty soon the business got so uh, big that I told my boss, I said, once one business interferes with the other, I'm going to quit. When I went to him and told him I needed to quit, he said, no, 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 you're not supposed to quit here. You're supposed to quit that fishing thing. And I said, no. <laughs> and so we, I did that in the 90s, and we had a retail fly shop at the time. And that's kind of what took us to Thailand is because while we were doing this, we were also teaching classes, <clears throat> giving clinics, teaching fly tying classes. I was, we were managing about 24 fly tires that were local. That were up at, most of them were Utah State University students. And they graduated, who knew, and moved. And so we had a dearth of fly tires and we didn't have a resource to, to help us because we had these orders that we couldn't fill. And by then we had gone pretty much worldwide and had made a presence uh, in quite a few countries by then. But we had all these orders, of, but nobody to do it. And so that's when Thailand came in. So, so my background's marketing and business and Rainey's is creative design and I just she designs it and, and sells it and I make sure we get paid right no that that's a great partnership um what from a marketing perspective I've I've thought about this um I know you're selling directly to to fly shops um but for the customer you know who maybe walks up and picks up some flies out of out of you know the, the little containers um for a lot of people they don't I, I don't know maybe maybe you can shed some light on this do people recognize, well, there's no way to brand a fly, right? Like it's actually, such a... there, actually, there is, because what we do with a lot of our brands, particularly Bass Pro demands it, and, and I think we do it for Shields. I can't remember who all, but we have quite a few of our shops that have us put a UPC code on the hook. Oh, really? Okay. And that has our name, it has our logo on it. It has the name of the fly, the size that it is. And then if you flip it on the back, it has a UPC barcode 
so that when the end user picks a fly out of the fly bin, they take it to the counter and they literally scan one fly. <laughs> so actually we can brand it. And there's some, we have, it's not just really the innovators, since we're uh, world renowned, we now have a, over 140 innovators throughout the world that design flies, not just Rainy, not just her son, but we have 140 innovators. We pay them a royalty. And some of them, their technique or a certain material that they use is, is pretty unique to them and people know it's their fly. Right. And people say, well, can you uh, patent it? You can't patent a fly because the patent rules are if you change 10%, you can do right. it. And it's easy to do that to a fly, just change the color of the tail or you know, add some flash and then it's, it's not unique anymore to that person. So, but in our business, we do have 73% of our offering in our fly catalog is exclusive to Rainies. You can't buy it from anywhere else, anybody else in the world. 73% of our fly offering. The other, the rest, of all the fly tying companies tie up and sell. And so that's one thing that we have is we do have a lot of exclusivity and our anchor product that got us launched is the flow foam that Rainy talked about that's become world renowned. And the greatest compliment I guess you can get as an innovator is you get copied. It's not good for sales, but um, one of her hopper patterns is called Rainy's Grand Hopper has been imitated probably more than any other fly in the last 15 years that there is and that's being imitated all over the world by all fly tying companies. So. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I, that kind of leads me to, to another question around, I guess, the business of, of fly tying and, and you, you mentioned some of this, but how do you stay, you know, as, as a fly tying company, how do you stay competitive and innovative? Like what are those things that you can do to stay on top? And you, you mentioned one, right? C creating an exclusive product, um, creating unique product, creating product that, um, you know, serves a specific market made by someone who understands that market, which I think is the genius behind working with innovators around the world, right? Because there's no way that you can travel everywhere and fish every river, every stream. So you have to rely on other people who understand those regions. What, what are other things that you feel like has, has kept this company on top, innovative, uh, competitive, um, whether it's on the innovation side, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, first of all, in the innovators we have, we have many um, submissions every year of people that want to be an innovator for us. And we do not pick them all. We're very selective and we have never solicited. They've heard about us and come to us. So we have a very good contract that we make them sign that tells them and us it's a legal binding contract where they can't sell to any other vendor. So it keeps it exclusive. So that's good. And plus we have cutting edge stuff and we have a pro staff throughout the world that if flies are submitted, we send it to those particular areas where they're going to sell to somebody that's on a pro staff, they fish it and they tweak it. And so we keep it fresh. We have probably the most innovative flies. We have a couple of comp nice competitors. In fact, the friendly competitors are good friends of ours. But uh, again, there's 73% of our offering that nobody else has. And it's not only a good offer that's very cutting edge. In fact, the, the slogan that I came up with years ago, the first the first slogan I picked was, I think, once you try to product, you're hooked. <laughs> but then after Rainey started inventing all these flies, she covered all genres because at first it was only trout. And then she went into stillhead and then into saltwater. And then it actually, she was the first one that actually invented flies for carp fishing. Hmm. And now every fly tying company ties flies for carp. But Rainey was the first one that, that came up with it. And so the, the industry knows that we're cutting edge and that probably the one thing that we're better at than anybody else is customer service. Uh, when we had a retail fly shop, we had a guy come in, he slapped a fly down on our counter and he said, I want a replacement because we guaranteed our stuff. And we said, okay, sure, go pick out the fly and pick that pick out two to replace this fly. And oh, by the way, how many fish did you catch on this one $2 fly? And he said, oh, 36. <laughs> and we said, well, if you think you still deserve a fly because the fly, the fly finally fell apart after 36 fish that you've landed, then you know, go for it. But, but our, our particular flies were known to be very well tied. And plus, depending on where we're selling the fly, 
for instance, if you're going to uh, sell a woolly bugger in America in certain parts versus Europe, we tie it differently. Europe tends to have flies that are tied more sparsely with less material on them. I don't know what the fish are thinking. It's a different language over there, but uh, but you have to be very savvy to what market you're selling to, and you have to have smart people around you. I think that's a great life lesson in general. Just have smart people, good people around you. Um, uh, on the on the international side, um, I, for those who don't know, I I'm not really familiar. Where are the where are the fly fishing hotspots around the world? Boy, there's a lot. We sell a lot into Russia, believe it or not, and into Denmark, into Italy, Germany, and Japan. Believe it or not, Japan and Japan is actually where most of the hooks are made. Hmm. Uh, South America. I'm trying to think of a country that we're not in that's pretty. I mean, we even sell into the Seychelles. I don't know if you know where that is. It's off mm -mm. Africa, but in Australia. Yeah, there's no ma major country that I don't, I don't know that we're part of England, of course, but we, we really do sell all over the world. Wow. That's, so. that's incredible. Um, what, I guess my, my next question for you um, is more on the, the stream work side. Um, and do you mind sharing a little bit about that backstory? And, and, uh, you know, we, we've alluded to some of that, you know, just, I, I guess the cost and the, and the turnover of, of doing flies, you know, tying flies here locally. Um, well, I will tell you the cliff note version of that. Um, when we had a dearth of fly tires, we didn't know what to turn. We had a fellow, a friend come to us and said, Hey, I have a fly tying company in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Why don't we tie your flies? We thought, Ray and I thought, no, we want American made. We don't want sweatshops. He goes, well, it's not sweatshop. We thought, okay. So he said, hey, you know what? My director, who's the director over there, he's been married to a Filipino, but he runs our fly tying company in Chiang Mai, and he will be here in Oregon in a couple of weeks. And so Rainy and I drove up to Oregon, met him, and the intent was to teach him how to tie the patterns that Rainy had innovated, and he would turn around and go teach his fly tires. So we were equipped with vices and materials. What were you teaching him? I can't even remember. Float foam, wasn't it? Okay. So we sat in the office and Rainy proceeded to teach him how to tie one of her patterns. They were 30 seconds into the training process when Rainy and I made con eye contact across the room, just pale. We thought, this guy does not know how to tie a fly, at least not to our standards of, of quality. And so we said, how about we pay on our dime to go over to Thailand to teach your staff how to tie our flies. And he goes, yeah, that'll be great. And so what happened is we put Rainey's son, Jesse, who's now with the company, into the um, MTC to go on a mission to, to Sacramento, California. And the very next day we flew to Thailand. And we know that because now he's got six kids. <laughs> so that was quite a while ago. So we flew to Thailand and at the, at the time we landed in Thailand, we said, you hire, let's start with 20, people that they will only tie our patterns and not yours and that way we're going to keep them separated and so 20 people were hired the very day we arrived and we taught rainy taught them they we didn't know thai at the time and they certainly didn't know english and so rainy would teach them through a translator how to tie flies and i'd be in doing handmade uh, hand drawings of step-by-step -step instructions and and it went well enough that we flew back home after about a month and then a couple months later they called us and said hey how about you two ladies come over here and run our fly time company for us because our general manager's wife wants to move back to the philippines he said what we've got a fly time company we've got a fly time shop or retail shop rainy has a community choir how can we do all this and change it so we we made it a serious um, effort to, to figure out the pros and cons of it. Bottom line, we flew over to Thailand. We managed the company for it, the company. It was called McKinsey Fly at the time. And so we literally closed everything up. We closed a retail fly shop. We looked at the map exactly where we were going this time and where we were living. And we moved over to Thailand. And we taught them how to tie rainy flies, and there was no conflict of interest because we never separated. We kept them as two different companies. And then, about a year later, 
two guys that had just retired from Microsoft with their millions decided to buy a fly tying company and they bought this company and they changed the name to Streamworks. And then a year later, they sold to 3M. 3M, we thought 3M is in flies. Well, 3M was in the fishing business and their, their name was called Scientific, or, yeah, Scientific Angler, which was their brand name. And they thought, you know, we're, we're building the rods and the rails and the fly line, why don't we just build the fly? And so they bought us and they kept me and Rainey on. And so we were 3M employees for a year. And they paid us pretty good money. And then they turned around and said, you know what? We've decided we don't want to be in this business anymore. How about you two ladies buy the company from us? So fortunately, we had a really good attorney here in Logan, Utah that worked out the semantics of it. We bought it from 3M in 2001 and have owned it ever since. <laughs> There's the cliff note version. And we're still in Thailand today. We tried Cambodia for a couple years and that didn't work out. So we closed that. We were running two companies at the same time. We called that company Flyworks, but we closed it in 2017, and we're still just in Thailand and still growing the business. <laughs> so now are, are they still two separate companies, or is it all kind of now under we, rainies? We, we closed Flyworks in Cambodia. Streamworks, believe it or not, is actually, we have technically three companies. We have Rainies Flies and Supplies, which is wholesale. We have Rainies International, which is distribution. Then we have Streamworks Thailand, which is manufacturing. The number one shareholder of their Streamworks Thailand company is Rainey's International. Hmm. So technically, Rainey's International owns Streamworks. Right, right. So, and and all of this from uh, I mean, learning go you know going fly fishing at at age five. <laughs> Absolutely, that's where it all began. Um, I you know for for you both, I mean. Where where do you see the future of the company? Um, you know what excites you? I guess what what keeps you up and 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 doing this every day? And um, you know what what excites you about about this? It's it's bigger than I I don't know. Is it bigger than you ever could have imagined? And you know what keeps you coming in and and thinking about well, okay, what are we going to do next? Never in a bajillion years would I have ever guessed when I started this that I would ever ever have be where I'm be where I'm at now. No, I absolutely didn't even cross even I mean I look back at it and I can I can see each step and how one thing led to another and everything just to kind of blossom to to build this company and but a lot of us because Ellen and I were very passionate we were very tenacious there are a lot of brick walls we hit believe me when we first started this there you know guys didn't tr didn't think we knew anything about fly fishing and they, and they would go or we'd attend a show and they'd say, Rainey, I thought you were a man. You don't know what you're doing. You're you're a woman. In fact, one one <laughs> there was a show that I did before Ellen came on board because I started doing a fly plates where you'd make the plate and then you'd sell it as artwork. You'd have a piece of artwork, some stream or whatever. A guy walked up to me and he started harassing me and he goes, he says, You have, have no business. You don't know anything about what you're doing here. And I'm going, and it, but he kept harassing. Can't we men have something all to ourselves and not have to share it with a woman? But it made me even stronger that I needed to, that I was going to pursue this. I mean, it was just some of that antagonism that he was exhibiting to me. And I was just so frustrated with it. As I, I'm going to do this. I don't care what he says. I might be a woman, but I'm good at what I do. <laughs> so that's kind of what. But we're very tenacious, uh, and uh, as we were, Ellen had alluded to earlier, we were, we were in every state except Utah uh, when we were selling flies, and we kept per persevering. And finally, a shop, one shop, opened up to us, the, the Collette shop up there at the Flaming Gorge, and and then we had a few shops that started carrying our flies. And but but very minimally, we don't we don't have a very strong presence here in Utah, not not really, but. I think what gets us going all the time is that there's always something new. The innovation is just captivating. Rainy's son, Jesse, takes care of all of our innovators and all of our sales reps. We have sales reps throughout the United States, too, that go into the shop and sell for us. We don't do it just ourselves. We have sales reps. But there's always something new. And plus, Thailand has become a second home, second family. 
for both of us. And it's, it's more personal now than just work. Yeah. So it's, I guess speaking, speaking of that, um, yeah. How do you split your time? You know, how are you able to, to run an international business? You know, I, you know, headquarters is here, but, but Thailand's a long ways away. How do you manage your time? I know this took a little, little while to schedule. Cause I know that you'd, you know, you'd been traveling, um, you know, and, and with current situation with, with COVID travels, travels a little more difficult right now, but um, how do you, how do you, how do you manage that time? I say I'm, I'm on with Skype with Thailand staff in most mornings and well, some mornings and most evenings. And so I'm managing every day still one-on-one, -on -one, but just by Skype. And I fly over two to three times a year. Rainy comes occasionally depending on her health and, and availability, but, um, but we're not over there as much anymore. We used to be over there nine, 10 months of the year. And now because of Skype and the open communication like this, we don't have to be over there as much. Plus, their staff is so dependable, and they, they think like we do now, which is which is scary. It can be scary, but uh, no, we just have a lot of confidence in them, and we still have a pulse on what's going on over there every day. Right. Yeah. Can can you uh, you you mentioned this? It was a little quiet a little earlier, but um, you know, when I asked like what keeps you you know getting up in the morning to do this, you mentioned this being more than work, it's, it, there's like a family, it's the people. Can you share a little bit more about that, especially with the international component? Like these well, are people involved in this and, and maybe the attachments that you've developed. Well, for one, our production manager, who is probably a good four foot 10 and 70 pounds wet. I mean, she's just a tiny little thing. She lives in our home over there with her husband who happens to be our phone manager and their 16 year old son so that they manage the house and at the time i had some dogs they've since passed but so they're over there actually living in in our space so to speak and just last night i was talking to her and she said hey two of our employees just got married over the weekend you know and it's just a big family thing that we're always going to the funerals we're going to the weddings we're going to the hospitals when the babies are, are, are born and it's a very family oriented thing and we keep in contact on a personal basis not just work related issues on what's going on and rainy in particular the interesting thing is they call rainy kun kun ma which means mother it's a title for mother and they call me kun yai which is a title for for grandmother even though rainy's older than i am i get called the grandmother she gets called the mother <laughs> but it's just a title of respect and we do things so much on a personal basis we when we do go over there we do vacations together sometimes with some of the staff and we go to their parties, they come to ours on social events, and it becomes a real, you know, bonding experience. So we're very, in fact, we just did our first Zoom funeral two weeks ago. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's, that, that connection is amazing. I've, I've talked to, um, I we actually had a conversation with the team from Cotopaxi at, in, in Salt Lake, a, you know, outdoor gear company. And and they they kind of take a similar approach, right? Where the, our factory isn't just a a group of people over there, nameless, faceless. We send them designs, and they send us back stuff, right? It's they they take a very similar approach, right? Like we're partners in this, we're family in 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 a way, and um, there's a level of of care and attention that goes into those relationships that I, is really refreshing. It it hasn't always been that way, and it's not always that way for for companies. Um, and so it's it's really nice to hear that you take that approach and there's that level of care um, because we're all people, right? And and there's, these are people who are doing incredible, incredibly skilled, you know, technical work. And um, it's it's nice to hear those those stories um, and that connection that you've built with with these people. Um, you know, I, kind of bringing it back home a little bit. Um, you know, how significant is it having this company? here in Cache Valley. For me, having any business here that's in the outdoor industry that has an international reach, that's, that's huge for our little valley. Um, you know, how significant has it been to be here, to have access to, to, uh, to rivers nearby, um, to test product? What, what's it like having the company based here? Well, when I moved here to go to school with my husband and our family, I fell in love with Cache Valley. It was not a matter of, of moving somewhere else it was i love cash valley and this is where i chose to uh, start up the business and uh, 
why not Cache Valley? I mean, <laughs> certainly that Denver wouldn't have been. But as far as fishing, the, the, my favorite place was the Blacksmith's Fork because I could get into it easier. I've got kind of bad knees. Logan River is hard to fish on for me but because it's so rocky and the water is running at high levels. At, at, you know, and so uh, my love, my fishing has been on the Snake River and uh, the, the uh, uh, a Green River down below the dam where I've done a bulk of my fishing. I've fished many other places, but that's where I've spent the most amount of time. And so I love the region. We have, we have the little bear, and we have uh, the upper bear. We have, um, no, we have the Logan River uh, bear. Yeah, the bear river. We have, there's a lot of places you can go fishing here. So it's a good place. It's a nice place. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know recently the, so the county and the city have been working really hard to make, try to make sections of Logan, the Logan River a little more accessible. And, um, you know, there's been a lot happening kind of in the section near Main Street, um, kind of where there, there's the big yeah. new River Woods development that's happening. And I know the city wants to make that a little more accessible. It's It's been kind of fun to see more people when you're driving back by, like into town, you see people just out on the river. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think I guess the state of the sport is here and, and if you see opportunities for it to grow here with, with developments like that and, and the city and county kind of making a more of an effort to make these places more available for people. It is interesting with people with the COVID, they are out more, probably more so than they would be. But what we are finding in our industry, yes, unfortunately, we've had quite a few of our customers close their doors because of it and some of postpone some of their shipments, but we see a renewed interest in fly tying. We're selling right now a lot more materials than we are flies to the end user. And, uh, and I think that there's kind of a silver lining to this COVID that people are more interested in actually taking the time to learn how to tie the flies, go out and fish and, and explore. And if the city can get involved with improving our rivers and and you know we're obviously all for that we endorse it we try to support our local clubs around here and um you know just those kinds of venues that will promote the sport that's great yeah can you i'd love to hear your thoughts and and you know you both have talked about this a little bit just kind of the state of the industry and and you know some of the well the frankly the the sexism in in the industry that exists um you know i've i i've I'd love to hear your perspective. I see some of our students, um, you know, getting introduced to the sport because they go to school on campus and then they've got the Logan river close by and they can go and fish and, and they, they discover this new sport. And we've had quite a few women in our program. They, they learn how to fish while they're going through our program. Um, and now quite a few of those students are, are working for fishing companies. I mentioned one who's working at Orvis right now and designing mm -hmm. product. Um, you know, I, I guess, what do you, where do you see the industry right now from that perspective? That's, you know, obviously there's so much work to be done and, and more to do um, and perceptions to change and, and, and thoughts, but anything positive? Well, we actually need another movie with the river runs through it, <laughs> but this time we need a woman casting instead of a man. It's pretty tough for women to get in the industry because as you know, it's predominantly a man's sport. And in fact, our tires over in Thailand are all women and they can't believe that American men are the ones that tie the flies. Mm. But um, unfortunately, it's kind of at a stalemate right now. Uh, we had two customers, actually retail customers walk in our door yesterday, a man with his daughter. And he was saying how his daughter is picking up the sport. And I said, yay. But all he could talk about was his son. And I thought, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, give her a chance and she'll haul, the, haul in the big fish too. So it's just a mentality and mindset that people think that fly fishing is a difficult, it's a finesse sport, but it does not take extra muscle, doesn't take extra, you know, whatever, just because you, I don't know. It's, yeah, so it's not a sport that, is defined by our gender by any means, but it, it seems to have been, but there just a bit needs to be more of an education since now we don't have a retail supply shop and we're not doing the clinics. The only thing we can do is support the local clubs that promote it among women and children. Our Jesse's uh, assistant here is, has a master's in fisheries and he's an excellent, 
he's an excellent fisherman, but he has two daughters and he's taking them fly fishing all the time. And that's when it needs to happen is it has to go from generation up and change the mentality that fly fishing is only for men. Um, but it does require a lot of patience and, and it does, to be good at it, it takes a lot of trial and error. But I, unfortunately, I don't think that there's right now currently a lot of, at least not that we've read about too much, about uh, interest with the women uh, entering the sport so much anymore. But we do have some, but it's not, they're not talking about it too much. A lot in Europe is happening. Probably more women in Europe are picking it up than in America. Right. Well, and it seems like there's there's such an opportunity to tell those stories. Maybe they're out there, but we 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 got to do a better job of telling the story. And and you know, maybe that's part of it too. I, there's definitely bigger issues at at play um, when it comes to this. But um, well, I know that when we were first in Thailand, with us being there a couple of months, we had two guys that were in the industry came to us. We were in in Thailand. And we were sitting on the lawn talking, having a conversation, and the two guys looked at us and said, you two women will get eaten up and spit out here in Thailand. There's no way you will be here in a year. Well, that was 21 years ago. Hmm. And those guys are no longer even in the sport. Wow. So yeah. coming full circle now, like Rainy said, the number one thing that we promote as to how do you be a success after almost 50 years, yeah, talent and skill and passion is part of it. But probably the number one, particularly in our position, is tenacity. Is you, you hit the wall, you fall down, but you just keep getting back up. And most people quit, you know, by hitting the wall so much, but you just keep going. And when you think all is lost and it's not going to work, you just convince yourself otherwise and move forward. Well, you you both are the embodiment of that. Um, <laughs> just just keep keep going and keep building and and what you've done is incredible and. And it's been a treat for me just to to hear your story and uh, learn a little bit more about about what you've built and and we're I'm just so glad that you're here in the community. So thank you, Chase. Yeah, of course. Thanks, thanks for taking time. I, I don't want to take more of it, but um, okay. But well, thanks, thanks th though. <laughs> yeah, thank you for for taking the time and to share that story. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chase. Yep. Yeah.